knowingly. Right. So it's important to check these out. So canon number one says, that, and I'm giving you the summary, that Jesus is really, he's truly, and he's substantially. I've heard catechists just say Jesus is sacramentally present. And it's true, but that doesn't get to the heart of the language. Is Gabriel in this studio? He's really here. Mm-hmm. Oh, is he on Zoom? No, he's truly here. Oh, is he on the internet? No, he's substantially here. He's right here. Oh, yeah. he's kind of here. He's No, I'm here in my body and in my blood and in my soul and my humanity, but Christ's divinity. And so the, the canon says, subsequently, it's the whole Christ. The second canon talks about transubstantiation. It's not a change in form. It's a change in the substance. So we have to be careful of what we say, especially to our children. Oh, did you receive the bread? Did you receive the wine? How come Father didn't offer us the wine? There's... There's no more wine present. Right. Yeah. There's no more bread present. Don't use that language after the consecration. Say the body of Christ, the blood of Christ. Even better say Jesus. Did you receive Jesus today at Mass? So that language is very important. And thirdly, this is the one that I actually am going to read. It's one sentence long, and it's the one that the devil is attacking us the most. And I believe it's at the core, the heart, of what we are failing with in the church today. And and I think you're going to agree. This one, I'm going to read it just once, so pay close attention. Ears up. If anyone denies that in the venerable sacrament of the Eucharist, the whole Christ is contained, we got that part, we know that part, this is the part where Catholics are, are lost, under each species, that means under what looks to my eyes is bread, the whole Christ is there, under every part of each species when separated, the whole Christ is present. If you don't believe that, let him be anathema. So let me quickly translate. That means if I have just what looks to my human eyes as one crumb of bread, I have the whole Christ present. Yeah. It's a person. If I have just what looks like one little drop of the precious blood, the whole Christ is present. So how has this impacted us recently in modern times? When the priest comes to me and, and he's giving under communion under both species, mm-hmm. which is a very new thing, it's only happened in the past 40 to 50 years, he tells me the body of Christ, and then I go to the, the Eucharistic minister who's distributing the precious blood, and he says the blood of Christ. Now I'm thinking, if, I'm, if I have no good catechesis, I'm thinking, this is flesh, this is liquid blood. I have two things here that are very holy, when the reality is I have a person here and I have a person here. Right. And then so that's one issue that we need to get through our minds. Also, the common practice of communion in the hand. I was taught communion in the hand growing up. Most catechists teach it because they think tongues are dirty and yucky or whatever. I don't know why they do it. (laughs) But when we receive in the hand, there are sacred particles who the church teaches us are really Christ who's present. And so if I'm not taught reverence for the sacred species and I'm receiving our Lord in a common manner, then that's going to impact my faith. So all of the habits that I want, and, and there's more canons that yeah. go on to say that these, these particles should be reverenced, that yeah. we should be giving even a particle, latria, which is a worship due to God. So the Can, habits that we have impact. Um, yeah, they are. Hi, Danny. Um, Yeah, they are the canons of the Council of Trent relating to the Eucharistic discipline of receiving only the the body of Christ. Uh, It was quite normal and the norm for way over 1,500 years that people um, who weren't the consecrating priest at the Mass would only receive the body of Christ. They wouldn't have the chalice or the cup as well. And that discipline was brought in for a number of reasons. Firstly, um, it was to do with the the profaning of the uh, the blood of Christ. Um, that means where the sacrament is harmed, damaged or disrespected. Um, a case occurred actually due to my uh, when I was ministering the chalice at a funeral mass um, probably a couple of years into my diaconate I was ministering the chalice and an old lady came up to receive from the chalice and she uh, she always insists on receiving from the chalice when the chalice is available and uh, she is so unsteady on her pins i really wish she wouldn't but anyway this she sure enough totted up to me 
I said, the blood of Christ handed her the chalice, and what did she do? She promptly tipped half of it down the front of her dress. Now, what do you do in a situation like that? There is, obviously, if a host falls on the floor, the minister has to cover it with a corporal and there has to be a special process of cleansing done to make sure no fragments of the host are lost. Similarly, if the precious blood is spilt upon the floor, again, a purificator and holy water must be used to clear up the blessed sacrament, the, uh, the blood of Christ, to make sure that there none of uh, our Lord's blood is lost. But when somebody soaks it into their dress, you can't exactly rip an old lady's dress off in the middle of mass and say, hey, quit somebody purify this immediately. So it's because of events like that and people spilling it um, or abusing it that the church brought in a discipline in very early times that it was the norm only to receive the body of Christ. Um, obviously, the priest who was doing the consecration at Mass had to receive both the body and blood, um, the, 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 the host and the chalice in his communion. But the church has always believed that when you only receive the host at Mass, you're still receiving the body, blood, soul and divinity of Christ in the host anyway, because Christ cannot be divided. It's a more perfect sign of communion to receive from both the host and the chalice. But the spiritual reality is that if you only receive the host, you're still receiving the whole Christ. And you can't actually receive more than the whole Christ. So uh, your dear Protestant friend there is, as usual, making uh, making up their own nonsense about this situation. But of course, Christ gave the church the power to bind and loose. And that includes uh, binding and loosing, loosing with regard to the discipline of the sacraments. And uh, if the church, which has been appointed by God, God, by Christ to teach in his name, says that it is quite sufficient to receive the host only, then it is quite sufficient to receive the host only, because Christ said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, etc. So hopefully... That's of some help. But yes, the Council of Trent was a marvellous, holy council of God, which was um, instrumental in fighting back against the Protestant Reformation, so-called Reformation. The Council of Trent was, uh, or to, you know, condemned Luther and Calvin and all their doctrines, their false doctrines, Completely and utterly, and it is one of the, the greatest doctrinal theological councils the Church has ever held. Um, so there's certainly no worries about taking everything in the Council of Trent as gospel truth, because that's exactly what it is. Anyway, hopefully that helps. God bless Danny.